we are going to continue our study in Daniel chapter 2. If you would turn to Daniel chapter 2. Last week, we ended with uh, Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. This morning, we're going to find the interpretation of that dream. But I'm going to begin this morning by repeating the dream itself, and then we will go ahead with the rest of the study. Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 31. Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar, here is what you saw in your dream. O thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. <coughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our study this morning. Our Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful day that you have given us. We thank you that you have gathered us together here together in this beautiful place that we have to worship you. We sit here this morning, Lord, with our Bibles open and we look to you for understanding. We pray, Lord, that you would give us that as we begin to do our study this morning. Our hope is that you will provide us with what we ask for, which is understanding. Be with me, Lord, and help me teach this lesson in such a way that it'll bring great glory to your name. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, the dream seems to be simple and strange at the same time. The king saw this enormous statue made of four different metals, a head of gold, a chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet and toes that were made of iron mixed with clay. The statue doesn't do anything it's not moving, it's not speaking, and suddenly a, cone, a stone, which was cut out of a mountain without hands, this stone strikes the statue at the feet and shatters the entire image. And the pieces are blown away by the wind, leaving only the stone which becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. Can you imagine the king's astonishment when Daniel started describing the, the king's dream? He didn't remember his own dream and here it had been given to him. And he, he was astonished by it. And also, can you imagine the astonishment and uh, the relief of the so-called wise men, 
Daniel had just saved their lives because they had been, they were being told to, to be killed. And we'll see later how these wise men repay Daniel. Daniel is speaking in verse 37, and he says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the fields and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, that the God of heaven is responsible for everything that the king has. God gave him a kingdom. God gave him power and strength and glory. God gave you man and beast and fowls. He gave them all into your hand, O King Nebuchadnezzar, and God has made you ruler over them all. Now folks, in the interpretation of this dream, I don't intend to go any farther than scripture goes. There are many who are given to wild and fanciful interpretations. They approach the passage with their own <coughs> preconceived ideas and what they feel that this passage must be saying. Well, I'm not going in that direction. I had a lady here at church tell me just recently that she was looking forward to hearing what I thought about Daniel chapter 2. I'm sure she wanted to compare what I had to say with the theories that other teachers that she had heard. Well, this is not a contest. Our approach will be what is called exegesis. Exegesis means that we draw out of the scriptures the meaning of the words of the text. The opposite position is a word called eisegesis. And that means that we read into the scriptures our own ideas and our own biases. Mine will be a very conservative exposition of this dream. And we will leave it to others to speculate on what it means. Verse 38, the last phrase, says, Thou art this head of gold. Daniel reveals to Nebuchadnezzar that he is this head of gold. The head of gold represents his kingdom of Babylon. Now the king may have initially taken this as a compliment until he remembers what happens to this head of gold it's turned to dust along with the rest of the image. Verse 39, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Daniel goes on to interpret the dream. He said that after Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, there will arise a second, a third, and a fourth kingdom. He says, after you, another kingdom will rise and it will be inferior to your kingdom. And next, a third kingdom, one of brass, which will rule over all the earth. 
And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, a kingdom as strong as iron, because iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks into pieces, so this fourth kingdom will crush and break all the other kingdoms. This means that the whole statue is a symbolic representation of four successive world kingdoms. Only the first kingdom is specifically identified. It is Nebuchadnezzar's and his Babylonian empire. Later on in this same book of Daniel, the next two kingdoms are named, and they are the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire, which is ruled by Alexander the Great. The fourth kingdom, the mightiest kingdom of them all, is never specifically identified by Daniel. It is simply described as having the strength of iron and having the ability to crush his enemies. As we look at world history, it's almost a foregone conclusion that this fourth kingdom refers to the Roman Empire. But scripture does not name that kingdom. If you take a look at the little handout that you were given, it may help you to see these time frames. The first kingdom, Babylon, continued for 66 years until the, its fall to the Medo-Persian Empire in the year 539 BC. The second kingdom, this Medo-Persian Empire, lasted 208 years until its fall to the Greeks in the year 331 BC. The third kingdom, Greece, lasted for 163 years until its fall to the Roman Empire in the year 168 BC. The fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, lasted 644 years until the fall of the Roman Empire in the year 476 A.D. Let's look at the scriptures again, verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. <clears throat> Finally, the feet and the toes of the statue were brought into view. We are told that this fourth kingdom will be divided. It will be a king. It will be a kingdom it will be partly strong and partly broken. Verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Amen. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Amen. So what comes after the Roman Empire, the Roman Kingdom? After this fourth kingdom, God will set up his own eternal kingdom. Here we have the fifth and the final kingdom.
kingdom. It's a kingdom that is set up by the God of heaven. It's a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It's a kingdom that will stand forever. Daniel sees that in the days of those kings, that is the days of the kings of Rome, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom. Christ came in the year 33 AD. This is the era that we are currently in. There will be no other era of man. Now this kingdom is not part of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw. Because it's not a kingdom of man represented by metallic pieces forged into a statue. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that a stone which was cut out of a mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A mighty stone was cut out without human hands. I wonder who could have cut it out. Without human hands. But by God's action. And this stone is thrown into the course of human history. Verse 45. And for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. And that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. That stone destroyed all of the kingdoms that were before it. Daniel lists every single metal of the statue. Iron, brass, silver, and gold. As he describes how they will be crushed by this new kingdom. This kingdom will put an end to all the other kingdoms and it will itself endure forever. I'm looking forward to that kingdom. Unlike the kingdoms of men, it is a kingdom that will never be destroyed. The whole point of this dream is not to simply foretell the future the future of earthly empires. But the point of the dream is to show that in the end, God will do away with man-made kingdoms and make his own kingdom over all the earth. Amen. It, that kingdom, cannot be conquered and it cannot be destroyed. No other empires will follow it. It will become like a great mountain which fills the whole earth. And it will be the final kingdom forever. Remember in the dream, not only did the stone smash the entire statue, but it caused the pieces to be blown away like the chaff in the wind. So God's kingdom is a final kingdom. It will never be replaced by anyone else and no one will ever overthrow him. There are a variety of interpretations concerning this fifth and final kingdom, the kingdom of God. Exactly where does it fit in? Verse 44 begins with these words, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Which days is he referring to? There are a variety of interpretations of this. There is the amillennial view. There is the postmillennial view. There is the premillennial view. There is the dispensational view and a variety of other distinctions in between them. 
this lady wanted to know my view. Well, I'm a pan millennialist. I think everything is going to pan out in the end. <laughs> I will say this though, Daniel interprets this dream without any mention of any of the millennial distinctions. They're just not mentioned in this text at all. In chapter 7, which we are going to come to perhaps, some of these things are brought out in a greater light, and I'm sure that Pastor Randy will deal with them at the appropriate time. I'm not getting into it. Daniel concludes his interpretation of the king's dream. There in the middle of verse 45. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. The king wanted to know what was going to happen in the future. That was the purpose of his dream. Daniel assured him that God has made it known and that it is certain to come to pass and that this interpretation of his dream that Daniel gave is a certainty. The lesson for us is this. History is not determined by earthly rulers. History is determined by the hand of God. God is in control of the whole flow of human history. Empires rise and empires fall. And it's all according to his divine purpose. By the way, when I said that Pastor Randy would give the teaching on all of this, Pastor Randy wrote a Thesis, I believe it was your final thesis or something like that. That was it. And uh, he studied and studied and studied and came up with uh, what I think is probably the truth of the whole matter. He'll teach that again one day soon. Verse 46. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. <clears throat> now this is a remarkable scene. This awful king, Nebuchadnezzar, who has just ordered the execution of all of the wise men, has now fallen on his face before Daniel, before this teenage captive out of Judah, from the land of Israel. Did Daniel approve of the king falling down and worshiping him? No, of course not. How do I know this? Our text doesn't say one way or the other. But I know Daniel. And I think many of you know Daniel by now. After all that Daniel has said concerning his God, do you really think that he could have approved of anyone falling down to worship Daniel. He had already said that it was God who had interpreted the dream. Another question is, was the king converted in verse 47 when he is praising God? No, I don't think he was. He was saying the right thing but only because he had just seen a clear and undeniable demonstration of God's power. True worship is in spirit and in truth. The king spoke the truth, but the spirit was not there. We will get some proof of this when we come to the next chapter, chapter 3. 
But here in chapter 2, look at verse 48. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Did the king actually make Daniel a great man? No. It was God who made Daniel great. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar just noticed that it was so. The king had made a promise earlier back in verse 6. In verse 6 it said, But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. The king fulfilled his promise. He loaded Daniel down with gifts and royal honor. He made Daniel to be the governor of Babylon. And he made, <coughs> made him ruler over all of these so-called wise men. Don't you imagine that they must have loved that? <laughs> Did Daniel forget his friends? No, not at all. It would have been easy for him to forget about his friend, but Daniel didn't. They're the ones who prayed with him. Verse 49, And Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. This chapter, which is basic, to an understanding of God's dealings in history and in prophecy, this chapter reveals three important truths for us. First, it reveals to us that it is not God, it is not man, but it is God who is sovereign over the affairs of this world. In another place, we read, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Amen. The second truth that is revealed to us is that our sovereign God has a plan for this world. And the third thing is God is ordering history according to his plan. And all of man's theories and all of man's charts are meaningless in the light of a God whose ways are past finding out. Here in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, these four kingdoms alone span over a thousand years. And now it has been over 1,500 more years since the fall of the Roman Empire. And God is still ordering history. Next week, we're going to take up chapter 3. There we will find that familiar story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Brother Red, would you lead us in prayer? Yes. Lord, we thank you for the study in Daniel. And we see over and over, Lord, what a mighty God you are. Yes. Holy God, we worship you, Lord. And we worship you. Lord, I thank you for this time that we can gather and hear your word. I pray for Father Randy as he comes with his morning service. I pray the Holy Spirit will lead us in all things that we do, that we might give glory, honor, and praise to you. And thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.